yes yes is very well yes great 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 nice so Thank guys you. this was from moe those who have gone to uh, enchanting experience in yelagiri so now we'll just start with the core session of today and the purpose that we have joined in today is to talk about wildlife and why it is important because this planet that we have we share it with a lot of other species and we have to take care of that for sustainable development and as soul we have always loved venturing out in the wild we have that special connect with the wild and that is why we thought another great episode to take to the people about why we should take and we take wildlife conservation seriously a couple of hygiene points or some do's and don'ts so that we have an enchanting experience on this connect with soul webisode as well so just during the session keep your uh, micro so uh, microphones mute and uh, don't uh, in case you have to answer anything or ask anything to our expert you can use the chat box option and it will be great like in case you have any other comments that are not related to the overall session you can reach out to other mediums but let's just focus on the session today and with that i have another special member joining us from us so somya ji is another special guest that we have live from bangalore and i just have a quick snippet of him that will give you an idea of how somya ji loves to explore the wild and he has been a soul member so just a small video here and then maybe somya ji can take us through his experience of the wild thank you guys and i really like looking looking forward to having this enchanting experience and a session on wildlife conservation thank you over to you somajit welcome on this another exciting episode of uh, connect with soul and good afternoon i think i'm unable to uh, you know uh, have my video on if you could just allow it yeah i'll just start that yeah that's all majit we can see you now yeah good afternoon all so it was a very small piece of wildlife in my life uh, so here i go on uh, we have a very very special you know guest uh, in our show today and uh, i would like to just i would like to uh, you know speak a, a few lines about him so he is the man who has studied in the wild the wild i would say the human who seeks the seeks the tiger to find the jungle the person who has opened up the door for many enthusiasts so here i welcome mr imran khan from the jim corbett hello everyone very good afternoon it's an honor to be here with all of you and sharing some of my uh, knowledge which i have gained all over a period of about three, three decades or so uh, well this is a very interesting topic and we have just been trying to come out of this pandemic and all that i think during the pandemic the most interesting videos you must have all seen was all about the nature rebooting itself you know from saharanpur and from ludhiana people were able to see the panchachuli peaks the snow capped mountains and then somewhere they spotted civet was found in kochi and neel guys were roaming around the great india mall in delhi and things like that and uh, and so on will someone share my screen or uh, okay all right you see so all these days the first slide i'll come to the first okay um all these days we have been struggling to uh, uh to basically decide whether we need environment first or development first but you know on and uh, also during the pandemic the many of the projects were passed which were uh, directly responsible for the destruction of the habitats of the wilderness and things like that all that happened and we have been still struggling to come out of that whether to uh, have more development at the cost of environment and uh, wilderness so that we have to decide now 
we have just uh, passed this day, which is the wild, wild, wild Wildlife Day on the 3rd, Mar 3rd of March in 1968, the United Nations General Assembly had uh, basically passed a resolution that, you know, that was a day when the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna, this was a convention signed by about 150 plus countries uh, when they had all decided not to do any trade in endangered species of flora and fauna. And then uh, on the 10th of March, uh, 2021, the United Nations also passed a, uh, passed a resolution where, uh, you know, the economic development would definitely consider the environmental protection and conservation. Uh, it will be the integral part of that. And this all happened because in 2012, if you can all recall, uh, Supreme Court had come out with a blanket ban on banning the tourism and all the core critical ha tiger habitats. There's a small little history about it, but I don't want to go into the details of that. Now, every tiger reserve was supposed to make their own conservation plans. So what we have been struggling all these days is that we want to save the wilderness. We want to save the naturally evolved biodiverse forest where the tigers live and the elephants live and all that. But because they all carry abstract values, which cannot be quantified, right? And that is the reason our policymakers and the decision makers and the politicians and the people of the country do not pay attention to it. Now, what is the reason? Why do we need to save the tigers? Why do we need to save the tigers in the natural habitat? What is the link between the tigers and humanity? All these things we need to understand. And it was all possible only if you could quantify the values of conservation or these uh, you know, tiger habitats as far as the ecosystem services are concerned. Now, in 16 tiger reserves, the Indian Institute of Forest Management had done a study that what is the valuation of the ecosystem services of these tiger habitats? And it was found that the ecosystem services range from 5,000 crore to 16,000 crore per annum. Now, this is a very sizable number figure, right? So now the government has started thinking about all these things. Now, it is not that the science has taught us that we need to have the tigers and all that. Next slide. Um, now, he is at the top of the food chain, the top predator of the ecosystem, uh, but everything becomes very tiger centric. And, you know, when we started wildlife tourism, that was basically to give some economic value to conservation because all these people living on the fringes of the forests, uh, they have been dependent on the forest resources in terms of firewood, fodder, timber, grasses, grazing grounds, and all that. And that all causes the degradation in the habitats. So all these people were brought into the main, into the limelight so that wildlife tourism was started. And the tourism, the basic concept was this, that the local people would get some uh, income generation, revenue, employment, and all that. At the same time, the people who would come to see all this wilderness would also go back educated about the values of tigers and their habitats, about the values of birds, and what is the relationship between human beings and all that. Now, fortunately, uh, neither in terms of religion, nor in terms of academics, nor in terms of ecology or science or whatever, human beings are not the, the top predators of the ecosystem. The top predators of the ecosystems are the big cats. In most of the places in India, it is tiger. In gear, it is lion. If you go to Amazon, then it is jaguar, mountain lion in North America. But tigers, and we, as you know that we have just done a, uh, an estimate of the tiger numbers and a number has gone to 2,967 or so, which is a very good figure. Uh, when we started the Project Tiger, we just had about less than 2,000 tigers and the number kept increasing without any foolproof method to count them and all that. The money was not used properly and things like that. So it all happened. Now, next slide. Okay, next slide. Is there a few? Uh, you see, our, our constitution, Sorry, uh, the Constitution of India, the Article 48 is still binds the state governments to protect the environment, nature, forests, and all that, right? Similarly, Article 51A, which is the fundamental duties for every citizen of the country is to, is to take care of the nature, environment, forests, lakes, rivers, and all that, right? Uh, is this the presentation you, you're not, I think I've done some changes in my presentation. If you can let me run that, I'm so sorry about it because there I wanted to quote something from Rig Veda and from uh, Mahabharata and all that. But anyways, okay, let's, let's go on like that, as you said. So in Mahabharata, 2,500 years back, there's a chapter called Uddiparyag where it is mentioned that do not cut the forest with tigers in it. Do not banish the tigers from the forests. The forest will perish without the tiger. The tigers will perish without the forest. Now this has a direct implication for humanity, right? What is the reason why we need to save the tigers? Now, Rig Veda, 
which is possibly the oldest scripture on this earth, which was written about 4,000 years back, also has mention of birds and wildlife and things like that. Okay, now coming back to the wilderness, as we said that we have tigers. Can we just go to the previous slide just quickly? And Okay, so we have tigers at the top of the food chain and the Indian ecosystems, almost all the ecosystems except the marine ecosystem and in gear. Next slide. Uh, we are the richest in the, in the world in terms of number of cats. We have tiger, leopard, jungle, sorry, leopard, clouded leopard, snow leopard, jungle cat, fishing cat. On, on, your, on your left is jungle cat, which is one of the lesser cats. And we have quite a few variety species of lesser cats like Palasis cat, marble cat, desert cat, rusty spotted cat, caracal, lynx. Next slide. Then we have the pachyderms like elephants. There are th three types of elephants now in the world. Till about 10 years back, we were thinking about only two types like African elephant and Asiatic elephant. But now the African elephants are divided into two groups. One is African savanna and then African forest. And now we have the Asiatic elephants. And I'm sure you must be knowing the differences that are about 10, 10 differences among the three species. Next. Then rhino is, uh, I mean, this is one of the most successful conservation projects uh, that was uh, saving the rhinos in Assam. Uh, about less than 200 were left at, at one point of time. And then the Assam government, as we say that the forest department has teeth, but they're not allowed to bite. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is always seen as a, as a dog in the manger, right? All the projects have to be passed through the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. So people don't like it. The Forest Department, unfortunately, has not been given its due. The Forest Department has been treated stepmotherly uh, by because they are the, they're, they're one department who are actually guarding the lungs of the country. You know, if you, if, you, if you talk about these national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, biosphere reserves and all that, they are the lungs of the country. So they are guarding them. These lungs have no direct economic value to convince the people of the country as well as the policy maker that you know this is very important to save us but the only abstract value so the project rhino was taken up and now we have a very good population of about more than 2000 rhinos surviving in uh, different parts of assam they've also been reintroduced back into their former habitats like in dudua tiger reserve in uttar pradesh next slide now we have this is a situation this is just a symbolic thing which i wanted to show you that you know wilderness comes in conflict with people and one, now one of the biggest threat to wilderness in india is the man the rising man animal conflict if i give you an instance right next door to my house just about 20 meters from my house there's a, there's a there was a lady who was killed by a tigress and this tigress this was her first litter and she gave birth to the two cubs and she's just been operating in my area on my right side right hand side is all Corbett tiger reserve my land extends all the way up to the edge of core critical tiger habitat and this lady had just gone about 150 meters maybe from her from her house to collect some firewood and she was killed now this tigress had become very uh, like notorious she has already attacked quite a few forest guards while patrolling she has attacked other women also uh, during the lockdown and now the cubs are about 10 months old and this poor lady had gone into the forest to uh, cut to, to, to bring some firewood and she was unfortunately killed. Now the entire township, the entire village and everybody is now against the tiger and the forest department. They want to kill this tiger. They want to trap this tiger without realizing the fact that this, there, there are two cubs of 10 month old, right? If the mother is caught, is trapped, what will happen to the cubs? They will die because they've, they've not been fully trained and this training from the mother to the cubs is the most important part in a tiger's life. Yeah, but if you want to see the ecological role of a tiger in the in its natural habitat, the cubs have to be trained. And that is the reason why we cannot release back the, wilderness, the, the captive tigers into the wilderness. Possibly we have more tigers, about 8,000 tigers in captivity, but they are useless. Um, all right, so this is the problem basically that many of the development projects go through the wild, through, through the wilderness habitats. And this is the, the situation. Now, what is the fault of this tigress? If she killed a woman in the forest, she had not come to women's house and all that, but now she's going to be clean because as uh, we, you, would, you would all appreciate that trees and tigers don't have the voting rights and the people living on the fridges are the solid vote bank. So in a democratic developing country, resources with abstract values uh, have very low chances of survival and uh, sustainable uh, or of, of, of sustenance. So here we have to find the economic values of these things. So this study by the Indian Institute of Forest Management has now been rightly um, uh, decided by the United Nations through, an, through, a, through a resolution that now the economic development of the country would take into consideration the environmental protection and conservation. Now, they have actually 
define them as natural capitals. Now, natural capitals of a country are basically the wetland habitats, the forests, uh, the rivers. These are the natural capitals. And one has to take into consideration the natural capitals while deciding the economic prosperity and human well-being. Next slide. Okay, now we have, uh, next slide, doubly. So as I said that we have a great diversity. In fact, uh, if you want to travel in your own SUVs out into the countryside, you would be able to see quite a few things like people want to come to the Komao, they can go to uh, Sariska and elsewhere and things like that, easy drives. You can go in the morning and come back in the evening. But yes, when you come to Kobe, definitely you need to stay one or two nights. But inside the national park, basically the private vehicles are not allowed, but you know, there are, Many forested areas in continuation of the, of, the, of the national parks and wildlife sanctuary people can drive. So I've tried to put in the slide where people can see all these common animals. This is the Calitas versicola, which is the garden lizard, uh, which changes the color in no time. This is a king cobra, which is eating a monitor lizard. And you know, monitor lizard is, the, is one of the biggest lizards. And it, is, it belongs to the same family as Komodo dragons in Southeast Asia. And king cobra is the longest venomous snake in the world. Whenever we see a snake, there's always this feeling that it's poisonous and we want to kill him. About 90% of the total snakes found in India are absolutely non-venomous. Only 10% may be venomous. And those 10% usually are don't, don't live near human habitation. They're away from the human habitation. Russell viper, pit viper, soy scale viper, uh, uh, king cobra, naja cobra, common crate, banded crate, and so on. These are the snakes. Next. And then we have three species of crocodilians in India. There's one called Estuarino saltwater crocodile, which is found in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal in the saltwater. And then we have the freshwater crocodile called Magar. Uh, and then we have the fish eating crocodile called Ghadial. If you see Ghadial on, on, on your right hand side is a male, on the left is a female. Now, during the breeding season, which is about the month of February and March, the males develop a special uh, organ, which looks like the pitcher or the ghada, which we use in the Indian houses to keep water in during summers. So it is a carrier of ghada. Now, the, the muggers, the natural mugger population is found in Chambal and other places. In Ranthambore, if you see mugger, they were actually introduced long, long time back. So natural population of muggers and crocodiles are found in the freshwater rivers. Next. Okay, then we have a variety of turtles. You know, you have turtles and tortoises, uh, the two different uh, things. Tor tortoises are mostly terrestrial, while turtles are mostly uh, aquatic. This is a tricarinate, tricarinate hill turtle, which is found in South India also, in North India and elsewhere. Next. Now, again, I'm coming back to the bird watching. Basically what happened that everything become very tiger centric, even the wildlife tourism, unfortunately, most of the national parks and tiger reserve like Bandagar, Kana, Rantambur, things like that, they have become very tiger centric, which is not the right way of seeing wildlife tourism because that is something when you disturb the tiger, you know, the big, uh, photographers with big, big lenses that chase the tiger. And then people have started naming the tigers also like Machli, Sita, Sharmili, and things like that. In Ranthambora spaces, it's T49, T30, and so on. So it's basically belittling the value of tiger. Tiger definitely being at the top of the food chain, it should be the bonus to every strip. But you know, you need to see beyond tigers. And one place where I can promise you something which you see beyond tiger, that is Corbett, you know, you can see Corbett possibly has the richest bird diversity, although Corbett also has the richest, has the highest density of tigers and the single, and the largest single population of tigers in the, in its entire distribution range. About 250 tigers have been counted last year in November 2020 when we had the last census. And then uh, the highest density, 19.5 tigers per hundred square kilometer, which is unheard of from, from many other areas. But the tiger sightings in Corbett are low because the vegetation is very dense, you can't see through. But Corbett offers a, the richest diversity of birds in any national park in India. Corbett has the highest number of birds, the highest diversity. We have about 600 species of birds. Next. Now imagine. Now what is the role of birds which they play? Now I was talking about the role of tigers uh, uh, in refining humanity or the, uh, the direct relationship between human beings and tigers and all that. I'm sure I'll be able to do that in the last. Uh, but you see the direct relationship between birds and human beings, you know, this is the important role which they play, controlling pests, you know, they are the natural pests, uh, natural, uh, yeah, they, they, they take care of the insects, unwanted, undesired insects. Then, the, then they are the pollinators also, the nectar feeding birds move from flower to flower, uh, to uh, uh, basically to help fertilize the uh, sex cells and create uh, new plants. 
then the seed dispersal they're responsible for expanding the forest they're also responsible for bringing the forest back you know some original tree which has gone extinct you know they must have i mean the, the birds fly long distances during migration and all that so they might eat something there and come and then do leave the droppings somewhere else so the 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 forest will expand next slide and then they are found everywhere so they are the early warning systems of any pandemic or any disease or something like that then birds and nature's clean up crew as you said that vishnu ji is the organizer of the life you know many of our gods and goddesses have chosen um, you know wilderness as their vahan like durga's vahan is tiger lakshmi's vahan is uh, is owl garur is the vahan of vishnu ji now vishnu ji as organizer of life so what do vultures are actually called garurs vultures they clean up the scavenge they clean the system now birds transform the entire landscapes where the birds are found they are found in jeels and lagoons and wetlands and uh, aquatic ecosystem and forests and grasslands and all that and these are the places which store carbon which release oxygen which also supply the potable drinking water so they are responsible for now birds keep coral leaves alive the sea birds basically when they go out flying i mean for feeding and all that they come back and then they leave their pungent dropping that dropping is called guano which basically uh, uh, sustain the coral reefs or the or the or the aquatic ecosystems now birds also inspired science the whole concept of aerodynamics right the planes all all people we all learned it from the birds darwin's theory on of uh, evolution through natural selection he studied uh, galapagos finches while coming out of this study next and we have some of the common birds which you can all see all around you uh, i mean this the caleach pheasant is definitely found in corbett only nowhere else but otherwise crimson cerber and stock bill kingfisher are really commonly seen uh, in places like ranthambore sariska bandavgarh kanha the places just outside delhi also you can go to okla bird sanctuary or you can go to some of the i think there are quite a few wetlands near noida and greater noida and also near gurgaon Uh, Basai, Tanda, and Surajpur, and so on. Next, purple sunbird is very commonly seen after the pandemic. Quite a few, uh, you know, gardens in the cities also they've 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 come back and people can see them. Then baya weaver is a is a rare bird. Unfortunately, it used to be one of the commonest birds at one point of time, but because of the you know what you call the mobile towers, you know, uh, electromagnetic field which is created so number has uh, gone down then then we have a spotted dove which is very commonly seen there are quite a few species quite a few species of doves can we go quickly on to the other slide uh, okay now what are the habitats for bird this is red ever david which is again very commonly seen elsewhere this is oriental pied hornbill which is very commonly seen uh, now these are the i mean if you want to do bird watching and all that you need to look for the habitat so wetlands like shallow lagoon jeel beach marshes rivers village ponds these are the breeding grounds and these are the also these are also the places where migratory birds come in loads uh, then we have the scrub forest the forest which is disturbed you know like aravallis you can see birds in forest like you can come to national parks or wildlife sanctuaries or tiger reserves or biosphere reserves then there are grasslands you know uh, agriculture fields marine environment mangroves these are the places for bird watching these are the habitat for bird next and then we have common kingfisher which is supposed to be the commonest bird in the world right now Uh, there is no other bird which is found in all the six continents except antarctica this is a bird which is found in all the six continents i can recall one of my experiences you know i met mr vijay malaya uh, in one of the trade uh, you know this uh, exhibitions interna- uh, and there you know i asked him that the kingfisher on your kingfisher bottle is an is an uh, you know what to call imaginary bird so why don't you change it with something which is universally found and i gave him this idea although i did not have a very good picture when i but i told him that common kingfisher is the is the commonest kingfisher which is found everywhere in the world and he procured this uh, slide from somewhere and now the kingfisher is the common kingfisher in the kingfisher bottle next okay black stock and peregrine falcon you see you have bird watchers uh, who just do the bird watching from their windows people some some people go on sundays out into wetlands and do some birding and all that but there are people who actually spend money and time and they travel from far off places and they just come to make their life less they i mean they make they make a list of their life how many birds in their life they've seen this is such a in colloquial terms we call these bird watchers as uh, you know what you call twitchers and uh, twitching is very very popular in europe and america i can recall one experience which is very much from cobbett there used to be a bird watcher from england 
His name was David Hunt. And he had traveled to Corbett a number of times. Uh, he used to bring bird watching groups from England. Now these bird, these people, that was a time when it was allowed to walk from Dhangadi Gate all the way to Dikala. I'm talking about late, uh, early 80s and then. So in 1986, he had come to Corbett and he had tried to chase an owl which flew from one bush to another bush. And without having any inkling that there was a tiger sitting on a, on a skill, he walked into that Lantana bush and poor guy was killed by, by tiger. And after that, the you know walking in the forest was, I mean, it's been disallowed, so banned. So this was an interesting experience. Which reminds, uh, now we have in India about, I mean, I'm talking about the Indian subcontinent, about 1300 species of worlds, total about 10,000 or so. Uh, it's because of our wide altitudinal range from coastline to the Himalayas, the, some of the highest Himalaya, the youngest chain, then very, very valid climatic conditions from, and then unique geographical loca locations. All these are responsible for the bird diversity in India. Next slide. Now, as I said that, you know, there's a long tradition, you know, in fact, almost all the religions in India, Hinduism is all based on nature, in fact, right? Uh, in Rig Veda, which is supposed to be the oldest, as I said, and Mahabharata also, you know, we have been protecting, we have been worshipping and things like that. Now, this is an owl which is called Jungle Owlet, no? Now, Lakshmiji chose owl as a vahan. Now, why, what was the reason why, why did Lakshmiji choose owl, owl as a vahan? There's something very interesting. Now, Lakshmiji is the goddess for wealth. Now, what used to be the wealth of the old agrarian Indian society? The crop harvest used to be the wealth of the old agrarian society. Now, owls have been blessed by nature to rotate their necks up to about 260 degrees, right? Perching on a branch away from the crop field, an owl could see uh, an, a rodent, could be a rat, uh, moving in the field, which damaged the crops and all that. So there, that was the reason why Lakshmiji chose owl as a van. Uh, nowadays, our benchmark is the Sensex and things like that, but otherwise it was old agrarian society. Next. Now, these are some of the, you know, uh, hard-hitting figures which we need to understand that right now what is happening, these are the threats to the birds in India. If you don't wake up now, we would possibly lose the forest, whatever is left. At one point of time, uh, at one point of time, you see, um, I'm talking about 19, late 20s, you know, about 40% of the total geographical land area of India was covered under the naturally evolved biodiverse forest. Now I'm using the word naturally evolved biodiverse forest because these are the forests which were planted by nature itself, by Allah, Bhagwan, Guru, Jesus, whatever you call it. No human brain can actually decide on as to what tree should come, what grass should come, what herb should come. It was all planted by nature and they existed much before our own arrival and all that. Now in those forests, as per the gene pool of the existing tiger population, we did not have any method to count the tigers. We, was, we, we had about 40,000 tigers in India. Now that 40,000 tigers are now reduced to about less than 3,000 tigers now. And that 40% of the Total geographical land area under the forest cover is now reduced to about five to six percent, which is you know draconian figure. What is happening? And then 80 percent of water bodies have, are all polluted, and mangroves have been destroyed, and all that. If you can read through all these, these are very uh, you know uh, uh, yeah. Next slide. Let's, these are two. Okay. Now deforestation of the habitats, right? Uh, is the largest. Uh, Contributor, single largest contributor in the section of habitat uh, everywhere. And there are quite a few reasons behind that. Next slide. Uh, you see, we have been hearing just about uh, a month back, you know, Supreme Court had to also intervene. And, you know, the Uttarakhand government was very keen on, on you know, expanding the uh, Jolly Grant Airport and then, you know, reducing the distance between Delhi and Dehradun. Everybody was, you know, uh, we're very happy that now it'll be just about two and a half to three hours, but no one is realizing at what cost. Some of the old 150 years old tall sal trees, the pure sal stands, which were actually declared as elephant reserves, uh, were almost kind of you know denotified to make space for more, more uh, aircraft to land in Dehradun. I mean to shorten the distance between Delhi and Dehradun, and we all have been you know as mute spectators. We have been, you know, seeing all that rape which is happening with the Mother Earth. You know, at what cost? You know, that is something which we have to understand. Next, 
Okay, and then the landslides, you know, the recent project, the recent Tapo one is Rishi Ganga, the, that tragedy which happened about 150 to 200 people unfortunately lost their lives because of the bad planning and planning and all that. Uh, next. You see, we believe in religions right now, everybody is becoming very religious, but unfortunately we don't read our, our own religions, our own religions teach that, you know, the primary values of the primary needs of human beings can be met first and the secondary needs of the human beings have been given lower position than than saving the wildlife and and, and birds and all that the secondary needs of human beings should be the third in number but what is happening now there is a direct tussle between the secondary needs and conservation okay uh, next slide i hope i am very much in time sorry Okay, these are some of the common birds, emerald dove and all that, these kingfisher, uh, okay, emerald dove, then the black hooded oriole. If you're driving through your Jeep, just stop the Jeep somewhere, anywhere like any uh, nearby countryside, you would hear a sound like <whistles> This is a black hooded oriole. And we have a very special bird of uh, oriole that is called maroon oriole, which is found in Corbett and nowhere else. Next. Uh, then we have the King Vulture and all that, if you can recall at one point of time, we had almost finished about 98% of our vulture population. And the scientists were trying to uh, find out the reason behind that. And we thought some viral disease and everything like some pandemic with, uh, in vultures. But finally it was discovered that we have this medicine called diclofenac, which we also use, which is a painkiller. Now, what do vultures do? They're the part of the ecosystem of that food chain where they scavenge on the dead cows and buffaloes and all that. So those cows and buffaloes were made to work extra. And in the evening, the farmer, the owners were, were giving them, you know, diclofenac tablets so that they can sleep uh, in peace to, and, and in the night so that they're ready to, do, to work again in the morning. Now, when they died, the vultures fed on the carcasses, uh, diclofenac infested carcasses of cows and buffaloes. And fortunately, they had to pay through the nose. And then, you know, 98% of the vulture population almost died. We are the richest person in the world as far as the number of vulture species are concerned. We have the bearded vulture, which is called uh, Lamagia, which is found in the Himalayas. Then we have the Eurasian griffon. Then we have, uh, then we have the long bill, slender bill vulture, king-headed vulture, sorry, red-headed vulture, then king vulture, and then we also have a scavenger vulture and all that. Now this is an osprey, which is a bird of the of the freshwater rivers. Uh, now, if the if the rivers are not fresh and are, are polluted and all that, this bird would finish. Now we have a bird called adjutant stork, which is found in Northeast India and also in Bihar and other places. Now they always nest on the top branches of trees. Now those big trees, if they are felled, if they're cut, and that is happening in the Patka, if you can recall, uh, and then the eagle nest in Arunachal Pradesh, you know, all those development and dams are coming up. Uh, so uh, if those trees are cut, where would, I mean, they have no alternative place to uh, nest. So all these things we have to keep in mind. Next slide. Uh, yeah, okay. Now that we have brown fish owl, which is one of the big owls which we have in, I mean, almost everywhere, the Asian barred owlet. Uh, India is the richest country in terms of number of owl species. We have the maximum number of owls in the world. Then also the woodpeckers, the maximum number of wood, woodpeckers. Then kakkus. And then uh, sunbirds, well, munias, these are India leads uh, the country. Next, next slide, next slide. Yes, now we have to decide, we have to take a decision now. If we have to, either we live a contented life with whatever we have, or we say goodbye to all the wilderness and the birds and the butterflies and the insects and things like that and expand ourselves, right? I'm sure you must have seen one of the videos or one of the viral messages during the pandemic that if human beings go extinct, the world would be so beautiful. But if the bees go extinct, we would fight it out, out on the streets. Now, I use the word tigers as the guardians of humanity in something which is very important. Uh, yeah, so something very important is this, that where do tigers live? Tigers live in the naturally evolved biodiverse forest, which are planted by nature itself. Now, what do they do? In fact, if you can recall your class 6, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th studies, you know, you must have heard, must have learned about photosynthesis. Now, what, what is what exactly happens in photosynthesis? Only green plants have been blessed by nature to manufacture or prepare their own food. Rest of us, rest of the organisms are dependent on each other for 
uh, 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 for uh, you know on 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 each other for food and all that. It's only green plants which can manufacture. Now while manufacturing that's chlorophyll, which is the green pigment, which they've been blessed with. The green pigment blends with sunlight, and the plants manufacture their food. And while doing the food preparation, they release oxygen, which is a byproduct, and then they absorb carbon. Now what is this carb? Where this carbon is coming from? This is the carbon which is coming from our luxuries, whether it is chlorofluorocarbons or carbon monoxide or burning of coal or whatever, all kinds of carbon it is absorbed by the trees, the green mass, and oxygen is released. Now imagine if the trees are not there, if the forests are not there, how, I mean, what, and I'm sure people living in the metro cities, they can, if they travel outside to the countryside, anywhere, any national park or wildlife sanctuary, they can actually feel the difference. And that's why immediately after the pandemic, the footfall in all these national parks and wildlife sanctuaries has, uh, has almost tripled and all that. If I can, if I can quote from one of the reports of the TripAdvisor, right? Uh, TripAdvisor, one of the most authentic travel advisors in the world, and TripAdvisor came out of the figure that Serengeti is the topmost national park in terms of visitors, and not only in terms of sightings of animals, but all because of the views, lakes, landscapes, and all that. And Corbett Tiger Reserve comes number two in the world. Out of 25 most favorite national parks of the world, Serengeti number one, Corbett number two, Masai Mara number three, uh, Kruger number six, then uh, uh, you know Bandhavgarh comes number thirteen. In that list of twenty-five, there are only two Indian reserves: Corbett number two and Bandhavgarh number thirteen. And some of the best national parks of the world come much uh, you know lower in position. So this was the situation. So everybody wanted to come out to the nature to unwind, you know, because people were locked in their houses. They wanted to unwind themselves. So that was the thing. So we need to really think about it and you know. Next slide. Uh, yes, here is thank you. I also would like to announce that uh, we, have, we have organized a small little quiz with some goodies from Tata Motors possibly. So can we go on to the quiz? Who's gonna take? Uh, thank you very much from my side. Okay, you can answer in your chat box. Okay, since I come from Corbett National Park, so the 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 founder they framed a question on Jim Corbett's jungle. Okay, what was the original name of Corbett National Park? Uh, there are four options: Bailey National Park, Healy National Park, Jawahar National Park, and Robert National Park. Okay, lovely, lovely. We've been getting answers from different. Yeah, okay. So Swatiji, should I answer it now or a little later or what, what's going to happen? 30 seconds time? Imran Khanji, let's wait for us another second. Let, her, let us have more participation. Okay. Just five seconds more. Right, right, right. You can tell me when I should. Yeah, sure. So we have the right answer. B is the right answer and Mr. Satish Kumar is the winner of this answer. Oh, lovely. lovely. Over to you, Imran Khanji. Okay, so it was Haley National Park. Malcolm Haley was the governor of the United Provinces. Now, United Provinces used to be the entire Sir, Imran, UP and Uttarakhand. Now, Uttarakhand has been carved out from UP. So Imran, it used to be... Just a second, just a second. I think, Swati, the right answer is Dilip Sundarendra Nath. He was the first one to mention Haley's. Oh. Yeah. I must have missed that, but Haley National Park was the right answer, which was so, option then, B. Then... Um, uh, option D, right? No. Option B is Healy National Park. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Not D. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Option B is the right right answer, which is Healy National Park. Even I, I, Haley. Even I thought it is the other one, Bailey National Park. Even no. I, I'm sorry. So Malcolm Healy was the governor of the United Provinces and Jim Corbett. Um, now, there's an interesting story about Jim Corbett. If I start doing it, it'll take about one more hour. So possibly I would recommend people to read his books. And I would consider him the father of Indian wildlife conservation. That early he had realized the importance of tigers and all that. But very interesting incident, which I would like to share with you. He used to initially organize hunts for the British Army officers. And he had once gone for a waterfowl hunt uh, uh, with three British Army, Army officers to a place called Nokuchiatal, which is not very far from Nenital, just about 20, 20, uh, 25 kilometers or so. Now, Nokuchiatal was a lake where there used to be a lot of migratory birds 
used to come from Africa and from Europe and Siberia and so on. So the three British hunters, they fired for about 10 minutes and about 400 birds were found dead in the lake. The color of the lake turned red. And this was the revelation in Jim Corbett's life. He totally gave up hunting for sports. He said that, what are these three, three men going to do with 400, 400 waterfowls? So then that was the time he started convincing and he convinced Malcolm Hilly to declare this area as a sanctuary. So it became uh, Corbett National Park, uh, sorry, Malcolm Hilly National Park in 1936. Thank you. And then it was changed to Ramganga in 1948, immediately after independence. And then in his memory, he died in Kenya in 1955, in 1957, paying homage to this man. The name was, the name was turned into Corbett Tiger, Corbett National Park. Next, next question, yeah. Okay, now this is a little difficult one, but all those people who have been uh, keeping touch with nature and uh, reading uh, articles on that. Changing climate or warming temperatures affects the gender of which animal, yes? Crocodile, frogs, sea turtles, bees, yes, Satish. Quite a few correct answers are coming, right? Right, Mr. Khan. We have Mr. Amrish Deshmukh as a winner for this one. Yes, sea turtles, yes. Lovely. Yes, right. The hatchlings, you know, uh, their, their uh, sex can be changed because of the high temperatures. Next question. Should we come to the next? Are we doing it in, the, in time, basically, the time which we decided or have gone? Time is gone? right, so it was quite an informative session and I guess we just have two questions that were there. So the winners, if you can just uh, put in your numbers to us in the chat box, our team oh. will quickly connect with you for your soul oh. release. Now, uh, Imran, sir, very nice and very fruitful session. And I see there were a lot of questions that were coming in when you were basically taking the session. Okay. So one of the questions that has been asked by uh, uh, Mr. Ashok uh, Sharma ji is basically, uh, is bird watching related to seasons or is that can be done all season around and how is it like? There? Yeah, it all depends on the place. Like suppose if you come to Corbett, you know, we have lots of migratory birds coming from uh, different parts. I mean, the concept of migratory bird is not just confined to the water birds like ducks and waders. I mean, if you go to Bharatpur, that's a time like if you go mid-October till about last week of February. That's a time when the migratory birds come to breed in uh, Bharatpur and the wetlands and all that. Uh, in Corbett, there are transient migrants, basically, like birds from the Himalayas. High Himalayas would come down to the plains. The birds from Peninsular India would come to the, the higher altitudes. Like, you know, uh, there are beater, there's an Asian paradise flycatcher, then there's a, uh, you know, Vadita flycatcher, these are the birds of the of uh, birds from Nilgiris, you know. So they come during the summers at this time, about March, April. And then similarly, the cuckoos come from the Himalayas at this time and then they go down. Uh, so the it is it it definitely depends on season. Yeah. But migratory birds, usually uh, the the ducks and waders, they arrive in India in the wetlands and all that. That's from mid-October till about February. That they're, That's the time that they're there. Yes. Okay, great, great. And another one was, which is the uh, number one national park, the largest number national park in the world and which one is in the India? In the world, it is Serengeti number one, which was, which was, which was actually Traveler's Choice uh, uh, announcement by TripAdvisor. The travelers have actually chosen Serengeti as number one and Corbett as number two in the world. Okay. And in India, which is the largest national park, I guess it's Corbett, right? No, Corbett is, is not the largest. There are other places like uh, if you go to, uh, you know, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, there is uh, Nagarjuna Sagar Sri Zilam, which is the Tiger Reserve, the national park, which is about uh, three and a half thousand square kilometers. Okay. Although there are quite a few uh, human settlements inside and so on. Uh, in terms of tiger density and tiger numbers and elephant density and elephant number, Corbett definitely leads. But in terms of uh, um, uh, rhinos and all that, Kaziranga is number one. The highest density and the highest number. But, yeah. 
So anyone... then, there, then, there, then there is a there is a national park which is called Desert National Park in Rajasthan, which is again one of the biggest in terms of acreage, in terms of area. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, any question? Yeah. <clears throat> any questions if you have so we can just quickly take that couple of questions you can just put your questions in the chat box and uh, we can uh, ask yeah. thank you ashok ji thank you so there is one from karthik a saying that he wants to uh, see birds uh, and what are the places to visit near sanand and uh, nal sarovar during winters um what's your favorite national park mr khan okay as a during my forest services i have traveled about 50% of the national parks in india i i i basically rate the parks in terms of the biological diversity and the landscape diversity and all that i like cobit and that's a reason why i decided as a child i used to come here with my grandparents who were great hunters so i used to accompany them and i decided right on the day one that i know i'm going to settle down here and that's what god has been very kind to me help me settle down here I like Kaziranga National Park where I worked, and you know we have this concept of five big game in Africa. Similarly, we have this concept of five big game in India also. Now the Indian five big game are elephants, rhinos, water buffaloes, tigers, and leopards, and all these five are found in Kaziranga. Nowhere else in India. Uh, so I I like Kobet, Kaziranga. In terms of the forest, in terms of the of the vegetation or the diversity in vegetation i would say uh, manas in assam uh, i also like kanha bandhavgarh aranthambore but unfortunately they have become too tiger centric right too tiger centric uh, so that's the reason why i do not go any more there okay. next any anybody else Yeah, one question is: What are the places to visit near Sanand Nal Sarovar during winters? Ah, well, Nal Sarovar is a good is a good wetland. Uh, people can go during winters. I mean, from where people would like to travel? I need to know their their location. I mean, near Sanand, the Ahmedabad in Gujarat, if they want to travel. Acha, acha, acha. I unfortunately I've been very little as far as the West India is concerned. So. Um, but i'm sure sasan gir is not very far from there and uh, gir offers good birding and the, there are wetlands uh, nearby i can recall going to ahmedabad and that used to be kankadia lake and we used to see a lot of bird but kankadia lake is a big town now uh, i used i worked on sangai in in ahmedabad zoo uh, long time back when mr david used to be the director of the zoo Uh, but now kankadia lake is very well modern it's a modern township now for almost got it got it yeah. so the last one is in karnataka if there are some good uh, wildlife sanctuaries to just uh, yeah visit. people can people can drive through yes that's a very good question in fact in your own suv you can drive through like kabini bandipur nagarhole and you can go all the way to uh, you know mudumulai and then you can go to uti in tamil nadu and then a gudalur side which is in kerala You know, there's a there's the, one of the most vibrant uh, biosphere reserves right now is Nilgiri's biosphere reserve, which starts from Maharashtra, somewhere place called there's a sanctuary called Bhima Shankar near yeah. Satara or something, right? And all the way down to Kerala to Gudaluru, you know, to Periyar, you can cover that. That's the Western Ghats. Great, great. People can drive through these, and it's it is allowed basically during the daytime. one can drive from bangalore and reach uti great i think you have given us a lot of ideas for our next soul drive and yes 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 i think they are just can do that yeah organize one so thanks a lot imran sir thanks a Thank lot you. one for joining in and i personally loved the session quite informative and they know so many things about wildlife and how mm. it is connected to mythology that was something very special to me yes. and uh, that being said Stay tuned, everyone, now uh, for all the upcoming updates. And thanks a lot for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.